Welcome back to my channel. My name is Brian Kapke, and I'm continuing the series Master Databricks and Apache Spark, the open source Apache Spark. This is lesson 11, where I'm going to start jumping into how to use the structured query language on Databricks. In this one, you can see that Saving Query Results is the title. The emblem, the logo, the two bricks, indicates that this particular subject in this video I'll be focused on Databricks. I'll talk about open source Spark later, but really it all is pretty much the same anyway, very, very similar. So we talk about saving query results to tables and how to do queries on Spark. Where are we heading? I'm gonna talk a little bit about the importance of structured query language, and then we'll be jumping into the actual code to see how we can query and persist data into tables. By the way, I'll put a link in the description where you can get my book, Master Azure Databricks, on Amazon, which really brings you zero to hero, covers everything from soup to nuts on working with Databricks. SQL is really the optimal Spark language. What do I mean? I mean that when you're doing big data, performance is really crit critical. And initially on Spark, there was no good way for the Spark engine to optimize how it queried and returned results. And because of that, it became a really problematic situation when you were trying to get your results back quicker. SQL was added for that particular reason, and what it does, if we look at this slide, is you can see the SQL comes in, and it goes through this series of processes which create what's called a physical plan. And that plan is Spark's strategy for how to get the data in the quickest way possible. And what that means is that SQL, when you're dealing with tabular data, columns and rows, is the most performant language you can use on Spark, period. So this is my Databricks notebook, and I will put a link in the description. I'm gonna be covering two different videos so that I don't go too long in this one, but in this particular video, I will put the link in the description and you can get that. It will also include the, include the code to the next video. Now what we wanna do here is where going to be doing what's called exploratory data analysis. In the data science process, this is where you try to learn about the data, learn a little bit about what's going on and patterns you may start to see. We don't know much of anything, do we? I don't even know what products this company sells. And that's not unusual if you come from IT. You may not know a lot about the business end of things. So this is where we start to get down to business. In a prior video, we I covered how to uh, upload, I walked you through uploading CSV files and creating tables on top of those files so we could do queries, etc. So you should already have that. And we created the database called AW Project when we did that. The database is really more like, in, in Spark terms, it's more like a folder heading. You put your tables under it and that way you can keep them separate. So we could, for instance, have DIM product in three different databases. And even though it's the same table name, they're separated. So you can think of it like a database or you can think of it more like a folder. And once you switch into it, you're in a separate space. Now we need to switch to this because that's where we should have put all our CSV files, or I should say our tables earlier. One distinction I wanna make with Spark tables is that when we create that kind of description on top of CSV files, we're really using what was called Hive in the Hadoop days, MapReduce days. And we can use that with Spark. What's really happening is the schema definition, the columns and rows are described in a hive storage, and then it can be used to query against the CSV file. So we can slice and sort and do all these things. The key takeaway though is two things. One, we have not ingested the data. If we were using a relational database, we'd have to ingest the data before we could do any kind of querying. We haven't done that. We've just described it, and now Spark is able to pull it into, remember, it's gonna put it in memory and distribute it on the nodes, and then it's gonna let you query using SQL. Because we haven't actually stored it anyway, we haven't ingested it, we can't insert an update to it because it's CSV files. Now, if we saved it under a different format like Parquet, then we could actually do some changes to it. And particularly, we'd want to store it under what's called Delta Lake. And there's a special format for Parquet that you use when you're gonna do that. So we'll see some of that later, but all this was just to get us to switching our context to AW project. So we'll be looking at that database. And that means whenever I select a table or anything, it will assume I mean within that database. It's already pointing there. Now, one of the first things I mentioned is 
we don't know anything about this data. We don't know much about the company. You may be new to the company. We may have worked in another area. So again, this is very common when you come from a BI area analytics. You need to get your head around what's going on in the data. What are we, the basic information just to start with? Well, one of the things we have is we have three different product description tables, dimension tables. We have dim product, dim product subcategory, and dim product category. And we really want to see these things together a lot, right? I'd like to know, well, what are the products and what are their categories and subcategories? Because that'll tell me, what are we selling? You know, what is this business about? So I wanted to write a query and I wanted to get the product category key, the product subcategory key, and the product category key, uh, product key, I should say. And I want to get the English product category name, but that's a lot to look at. I'm just going to call it category. And that's going to come from the excuse me, yeah, product category table. And I want to take the English product subcategory name, which is also a lot to say, I'm just going to call it subcategory. And even model name is a bit verbose. I think I'll just call that model. So let's look at the query that we're going to run here. And I'll run it and then we'll walk through the query. Okay, so we can see now, walking through here, we got the product, the keys to those tables, the category and subcategory and model. Before we go into the query and how we got it, it's useful to see that we now know, okay, they sell clothing. They also sell components, bikes, a lot of bikes, components again. So we see the kinds of things. And I think somewhere in here, we also see accessories. So those are some of the things. And we can see they have different models in here. You can also see that the 175 rows, fortunately in, da in the Databricks notebook, it gives us how many rows came back. So we know that there's only 175 distinct products. So that tells us some good information right there. Okay, let's look at the query how we got here. Well, we're selecting our columns, the product key, the product subcategory, product category key, where here's where we're getting the English product category name. And we don't like calling it that, so we're gonna call it category. And you'll notice in the column heading here, okay, that's what it actually called it, category. And we can do the same thing with English product subcategory. We can just call it subcategory. And you can see um, here, that's what it did. That's great. Well, we got to get the product columns from dim product. So we're going to start with that. I like to start with the most, um, the table with the most rows typically is where I usually begin. Or if it's, and yet it's typically some sort of fact table if it's not dimensions I'm dealing with. So I want to start with the product table. And, and then I like to generally do left joins off of that, so or something, or, or inner joins. Uh, so I'm going to say dim product. And we can create a short name for the dim product called P here. It's an alias. Then we're going to say we're going to do an inner join for dim product category, and we're going to give it an alias of S. Now notice this P here is here. And that's because product key is on more than one table. If I don't tell it which table to take it from, I'm going to get an error. It's too ambiguous. Which one do you want? So I need to tag it with the alias. So it's going to come from the dim product table when it gets product key. The product subcategory key is going to come from the subcategory table. And the category key is going to come from the category table. Again, these could be ambiguous columns. So I need to tell Spark which one I want. Now I'm joining to dim product subcategory. And I'm using for this the keys, the dim product P subcategory key, which is on that table. And I'm joining it to the sub product, the product subcategory key on the dim product subcategory. I'm going to second say those words. Uh, so then we have category, and we're doing the same kind of thing, joining on the keys relevant to that. All right, so we got that, and I'm adding this where clause mostly to show you that you can filter as well. And so we're going to filter this where the product status is equal to current, or the product status is going to null in it because the CSV put that in there. Uh, so that's what we've got. And that's about it. It's not too complicated for that word. So we're going to create a table called T underscore product info that contains the data from the prior query. I'm prefixing this name with T underscore to indicate really to me that this is a table. So T underscore product info means it's a table. And I would use V underscore product info if it was a view. And I'm not going to talk about views right now. But table is going to be distinguished by T underscore. It's kind of a naming convention. And you might say, well, you didn't follow that on DIM and all this fact stuff. And you'd be right. 
Uh, so it's a bit arbitrary, but it is something I kind of want to introduce is thinking of naming standards and ways to do things like this can be useful. Since I want to create this table, first thing that I should probably do is delete the table if it exists. Now I do this because otherwise when I try to do the create table, it will give me an error and I, might, I may want to be able to run this notebook or this cell multiple times. One of the things to bear in mind is when we take data from the CSV file and insert it into a table as we'll be doing, it will never get refreshed unless we rerun this process to extract the data again. So we're taking a snapshot. A snapshot. Now, let's step back for a minute. The CSV file could be getting refreshed. It could be getting a new update every night, appended, whatever. It could be just getting a new copy. We will not see that unless we refresh the data. We'll see how to use views as a better way to do it if the data is changing. Views can be more flexible that way. But you may want to do a snapshot. You may say, OK, this is my end of month data. This is what I want to keep querying on. So I could create a table, and that will stay there no matter what happens to the source data underneath it, those source tables. Now, the only thing that's changing is we're dropping the table, and we're adding this statement, create table, table name, as. That's it. The rest of this is just a query that we did before. All right, so I'm going to select this. All that is identical. So we can take the results of our query and store it into a permanent table that easily. I know, right? Simple. It's really powerful, too, because now we could do this query. We can save it to a table. And we can come back tomorrow, the next day, next month. And we already have this flattened out version of the product dimensions. We don't have to keep joining them. One of the reasons I wanted to pull the keys together is that if for, if for some various reason we do decide, you know, it would be nice to get some column out of, say, the product table that we didn't get, we can just join to it and grab that column and still use it and stick to the, the core T product info and not have to add a lot of complex query logic. But most of the time, we can now just join to T product info and we don't have to go off and do all that extra coding, which is just a pain. We now have a very reusable, useful thing. Dry is the principle they call it in Python. Don't repeat yourself. And that's a key thing here. Repeating yourself means by replicating code, by doing it more than once, it's very inefficient and it's hard to maintain. So you don't want to do that. All right, so let's run this code. And if we did it right, we should have a nice table that has a flattened out version of our product data. So let's run this query. Now that we've got our table, you can see here it succeeded, right? And we're going to run this query. We're going to query the T product info table, and we're going to get distinct, meaning unique, values for product, subcategory, category. And then we're going to do a count of this with num products. And we're going to group this by model, subcategory, and category. And we're going to order it by the number of products. Now, this may seem strange because you would think that you would only have one model right, with the same name. You wouldn't have a product with the same model name multiple times. But actually, you'd be wrong. Apparently, they do this at AdventureWorks. These are the kind of things you will hit in the real world, and you'll scratch your head. So it turns out that you might have the MG100 bicycle, and it might be 10 different products in the product table. And it turns out that there are different associated variables like the, the frame type or the color that may make a distinction. So that's why it happens. But it can be very confusing. And for our purposes, we're really more concerned with the model. We don't really care about those lesser details. So let's run this just to see what happens. Okay. So what we can see here is a model, subcategory, categories, and number of products. Now what seems strange here is you'll notice, although we have the Mountain 200, there are 12 rows in the product table with that exact same model name. So that seems a little strange. We have 10 with the same LL Touring frame, and that's a component. So it turns out we now know for certain that there are actually multiple products with the same product name or model. So it's something to be aware of, because uh, that could throw us off. We could end up with you know, counts or things that don't look right to us. So good to know that we have that. And let's uh, look at this query. Pretty much, we're doing an aggregation query. So a couple of things I do want to point out is we're doing a group by, so we're actually summarizing data. And when you're using Spark, probably a good idea to do that. If you're going to return the data to the driver node, which we're doing here to bring it into display, 
then you don't want to necessarily pull back like millions of rows. So aggregation is a good idea. And because we're using Sp Sp uh, Spark SQL, it's going to do it in a really efficient way, at least the best it can do. This function count, there are a number of aggregate functions, and I'm going to talk about more of them later, but one of them is count. So by using, uh, when we use count, the fact that it is the SQL count function means that it's going to be, again, an efficient function for doing counts. And functions that are pushed out to the nodes can be really bad in performance. If you do them right, they won't be. And the engine now with performance optimizers does a lot to reduce that. But in the old days, that could really be a problem. But Spark SQL is extremely performant on these things. So again, it's sort of a no-brainer. When in doubt, use SQL because it will do things really well. All right, so here we have this count. And finally, we're doing an order by. And if we do a descending order by, it's going to go from highest to lowest. And that way, we can see which product has the most duplication. And we can see that there. So that's pretty cool. Now, a couple of things I also want to point out is that we can get information about the product table by using describe, as we've seen before. So if we describe it, we can see we've got the product key and everything and the data types that go with that. Now, I want to demonstrate something kind of interesting, too. Let's take a look at the create table statement for dim customer, one of the CSV files we've created a SQL layer over. And then we'll look at the new table we created. So dim customer comes up here, and we can see the whole definition. And by the way, this is a great way if you just want to create a table, you can cut and paste from doing this. But notice this. Um, here from it. DBFS, it, you can see that it's actually from the table we uploaded earlier, dim customer CSV. So this schema definition is pointing to the CSV file. It hasn't replicated it. It's just sitting on top of it. Let's take a look, though, at our new T product info. This has a description, but notice it says using Parquet. Parquet is a very efficient, compressed column store format for data that you can save data to. And it's really optimized for usage in distributed platforms like Spark. So it's really the way to persist data. This is, as I mentioned earlier, it's a copy of the data, but it's not saved as CSV anymore. It's saved as a partition data set in a format called Parquet, which is a lot more efficient and can do more than if you were just pointing it to CSV. So Parquet, and there's a particular optimized format for Parquet when you're doing Delta Lake, which is really where you want to maintain data very similar to SQL tables on a database, is a way you can store data to do that. So you can persist it bringing in, slice it, and do things with it. So I'm not going to talk a lot about Parquet now, but somewhere down the road, we hopefully can get into more details about that. All right, so that's the end of the video one. I'm going to continue in video two with the same notebook. I'll put the link to it in both, in both descriptions for the videos. But you're only going to get one notebook, so don't get confused. We started out by talking about the importance of SQL on Spark. And there's two big takeaways. One, it's a win-win because you not only get this rich, expressive, full implementation of SQL on Spark that we can use, but two, it just happens to be the most performant way to query tabular data on Spark. So you get a win-win. I'm going to get more into that details later. But then we looked into how to use SQL to query and then persist data into Spark tables. So that's about it for this. Please like, share, and subscribe. I want to thank you. Tell your friends about the channel. I look forward to comments in the description. And until next time, I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together.